Good afternoon, um, everybody. If you could just stand up from your seat and take a deep breath and put your arms up and shake it all out. Um, we're gonna get started on um, the afternoon breakout session uh, titled Building Resilience Through Disaster Relief and Recovery. Uh, my name is Jonathan Suri. I'm a senior staff associate at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. Um, I will be one of your speakers and moderating today's uh, panel discussion with uh, Dr. Pam Chapman and Nick Wiersma. Um, I, I'm honored to be here today, invited by uh, Save the Children to participate in the session um, on this really important topic um, that is really so cross-cutting across so many sectors within um, all of our organizations and across the whole country. Um, there is such an interdependence on these relationships that we all have to promote food security um, in this time of climate change, of severe natural disasters, um, and an unforgiving economic climate. Um, it creates such complexity and requires us all to work together. Um, as I mentioned, joining me today uh, is Nick Wiersma of Convoy of Hope and Dr. Pam Chapman, boss lady, um, who um, Nick will be providing a, uh, an organizational perspective uh, from a large NGO uh, perspective of relief um, around food. And Dr. Pam Chapman will be focusing a little bit more on the regional and local aspects um, of response and recovery and relief services. services. Um, I will try and give a broad overview and perspective um, of some of the research that we've been doing uh, with and for Save the Children on this topic. Um, and uh, frame it around um, disasters and disaster response. So we can go ahead and advance it to our slides. And one quick reminder, um, there is a Q&A and a chat function on the right side of your screen. Um, use the chat function to chat with each other and chat with us. And if you have any specific questions, um, please put them in the Q&A and we will uh, collect those and utilize them um, at the Q&A session at the last 10 minutes of, of today. So. Um, if we can go ahead and start. Um, so today's for my presentation, um, it's titled Building Food Security and Disaster the Rural Considerations. Um, uh, I'd like to thank my project team working on this, Sean Hansen, Chandressa, Emily, Antonia, and Jeff, um, who are all working on this research initiative together. Next slide. Um, and who is NCDP? We are the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at the Columbia Climate School um, at Columbia University in New York. Um, we've been doing this work for now 20 years. It's our 20 year anniversary um, and have done a lot of work in long term disaster recovery research, um, community engagement um, and a history of working in post disaster recovery settings. Um, we also have a, a history of working with Save the Children. Um, it's specifically on the Resilient Children Resilient Communities Initiative, which is a resource that I recommend you checking out. Um, we have uh, the project site as well as a toolbox that we created that has a lot of planning tools um, that can be utilized by any organizations engaged in uh, preparedness and response planning. Next slide. This uh, work that we're doing is kind of born out of an opportunity to do some research for Save the Children who really wanted to take a closer look at issues in the United States around um, how rural and being rural impacts children. And we are specifically looking at child care, at food security, psychosocial support, child protection, education, and housing security. And we'll be producing a report that will be um, uh, part of this project that will be available in, um, in the future. Uh, we already have one product available, which I'll be talking about today, and I'll be providing you a link of where you can go to access that information on the Save the Children resource website. Uh, so for today, uh, this is the outline. We'll do um, a little bit of an overview of rural definitions, um, uh, dimensions of food security, rural context in food security, food security and disasters, and some key takeaways and recommendations from our, our findings and a couple different um, pieces of our research. It's a little ambitious, but we're going to move quickly um, over some of the statistics, which I'm sure many of you already know, but they're going to be here for your reference um, and um, use at a later time after today. Next slide. So when we wanted to know about how some of these issues affect the rural US, we wanted to know about what is rural and what does that mean? And in general, there is no real um, uniform and unified definition of rurality in the United States across all different agencies. And we took a little bit of a deep dive into that 
Um, and specifically, we're looking at how children were counted and how children in poverty were counted. Um, and we ultimately landed on using the HRSA definition or the HRSA definition, um, which captures around 2.9 million children in poverty, um, which is slightly more than most other definitions that are being utilized. And why does this matter? Next slide. The Census Bureau is basically a definition that is um, a definition of separation. It only intends to separate urban and rural areas. OMB's definition of integration is a, is a measure of integration, meaning it understands that there is some interconnectedness between counties, between different areas, between different census tracts. And so if we use the OMB definition, that Census Bureau definition interchangeably, we are using them in slightly contradictory ways and we end up counting the population differently. Next slide. And so what ends up happening is that there's actually a large proportion of rural residents that live in metro areas, um, 30 million to be exact. And so it, it, you, it can exclude a very large portion of the population depending on which one you use. And that's why we chose the HRSA definition because it also ended up capturing and utilize those um, USDA uh, RUCA definitions as well as expanding that um, to include larger census tracts um, that have um, maybe more sparsely populated, but are bigger in area and um, are ultimately rural in character, um, but are often not captured in some of the other definitions. Next slide. And so this is a map that we put together um, just to give you an idea of um, agreement between various definitions. We took about nine different definitions, mapped them out and, see, and saw where there was agreement and where there was some disagreement. And so if you look at the West Coast, you can see, especially the Southwest, you can see quite a bit of disagreement between different definitions. Um, and so it's important to know which um, definitions are being utilized by with, which agencies and how that may count your county, or in this case, census tract differently. And of course, this is tied to various eligibility for different types of programs and services. Next slide. And just another example, this is a, again for your reference, this is using the HRSA definition to show you the coverage that it has and specifically how children in poverty are counted. Um, and we can see some very high pockets um, throughout um, the Southeast um, as well as the Southwest. Um, but again, this is for your reference and um, the link on the bottom of the page will take you to a live map where you can drill down a little bit further and explore this for yourself. Next slide. Um, looking at food, food security in blue sky times, um, specifically looking at rural areas, food security um, or insecurity is slightly higher than the national average um, with about 10.8% of households being food insecure. And among rural households with children, that increases to 13.7%. And 6.4% of rural households have children that are food insecure. Um, so these are children themselves that are food insecure. Next slide. And some of these disparities um, are also um, transferred through, through race, ethnicity, looking at the blue charts in the graph, food insecure households um, of whites um, are 7%, Hispanic families 16%, Black families 19.8%. And if you add in children into those households, those numbers are even higher. And this is across the whole population, not just rural. Um, and this carries on as well for households living below 185% of the poverty line. Next slide. We wanted to take a look back at, at, at what are the traditional dimensions of food security. And this is the FAO um, definition, which gives an overview of access, utilization, stability, and availability. Availability means that there's sufficient quantities of food. Access means that people have income and it's either income or the physical access to get food, to access that food. Um, that people have the ability to utilize it, cook with it. Um, that it's culturally appropriate and that it's stable and disasters create instability in systems. Um, and that's what we want to start accounting for a little bit better. Next slide. Um, so again, those, uh, those pillars are availability, access, stability, and utilization. But there's also been another two dimensions of food security that have been thought about and talked about a little bit more. One of them um, is sustainability. Um, the sustainability is, um, factoring into account large changes in climate um, and sustainability of the whole ecosystem in which food is produced um, 
from the agricultural level all the way up to um, the grocery store. And then agency, which is um, really accounting for how individuals um, are able to make choices about their food, um, whether that means that they can cook it in the way that they want to be able to, um, that they have the physical um, ability to do so, uh, meaning they may not have um, the mobility that they need to have or the language um, ability that they may need to have to be able to access food. Next slide. And so when we look at rural context and barriers to food security, there are structural challenges and economic challenges. Some of these structural challenges are about um, location away from urban centers and the travel time that is required for accessing social services and food providers. Um, that reduced population density may also contribute to reduced economic opportunities. And um, there may also be reduced transportation um, for accessing food. Poverty rates are also high as we have discussed. Next slide. COVID-19 really threw our world upside down and I think shown a very bright spotlight on the importance of food security and the role that so many different actors and stakeholders have in a community to ensure the, the food security and access for children in particular. Um, and I think a lot of this burden was especially placed on schools who really rose to the challenge and met a, a very um, important need, um, especially when children weren't able to attend school in person. Uh, in 2020, rural households with children face higher rates of food insecurity compared to suburban areas. Um, and even with that big step up that these um, schools had, um, there was still a reduction in about 480 million meals provided um, through the child and adult care food pro uh, program. Um, household applications for SNAP um, or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program um, increased by 111%. Um, and we already know that there's a higher utilization of SNAP in rural areas compared to metropolitan areas. And we also know that there were so many supply chain disruptions during the COVID crisis, which showed us how um, complex um, the system actually is. Next slide. This is a slide um, that I won't talk about, but is here for your reference. It just kind of highlights the linkage between food security, poverty, health, and COVID-19. Next slide. Taking a big step back to disasters and some of the inherent inequities uh, within disaster response and recovery, um, we know that there is an increase in federal funding for disasters. However, studies have shown that that money is not being equally and equitably distributed to the communities that need it the most. And so this can actually further entrench people into poverty um, and um, is an example of what we call a poverty trap. So uh, pushing people further and further to the edge, further and further marginalized and um, forcing them to pay what's called a poverty penalty, um, which is not what we want to happen. And Furthermore, um, there is this inverse equity hypothesis that those who have the greatest need get those resources last, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, next slide. Uh, within um, within the, the world of disasters and food security, um, we have to talk about food system failure. And there are three main ways that systems can fail, inaccessibility, inaccessibility unavailability, and unacceptability. Um, and so the way these kind of manifest are in physical ways for access that because of the uh, dispersion of rural households, it's really hard to get um, food and resources to people. Damaged infrastructure um, can um, disrupt the ability to actually get food out. Um, and, and furthermore, when you look into a recovery setting, um, repair and restoration can be extremely slow and protracted. School closures can reduce access to food programs that are so essential for these kids. Um, and then there's the affordability or the economic component of access. Disasters exacerbate that financial hardship that um, we know is so intertwined with food security. Um, and many Americans are already at the brink of bankruptcy, being one paycheck away from, from bankruptcy. Um, and so these disaster events push people to their limits, especially if there is not a federally declared disaster that opens up 
some additional funding for people. And of course, supply chain disruptions can drive up the cost of food. Um, this very confusing diagram is something that you might want to sit with later, um, but this is a fault tree diagram, and this shows us the places in which um, the food system can fail. And I just wanted to just point out um, the middle of the chart where it says food is not available, and the, the few components that are required um, for a system to fail, and that includes the supply chain, food bank donations, other food assistance, and supply chain again. Um, which affects both donation and the overall availability of food. We go to the next slide. And so uh, the supply chain, if you look at the bottom, there are different types of supply chain failures, any of which can cause a, a cascading effect of an extra, a total system failure. Um, and so this is the basis of what I'm gonna show you next, which is disaster food security framework. Um, and this is born out of some research based on that fault tree um, that I showed you before of understanding where systems can fail. Um, and it utilizes, if you notice, some of those same components of the, um, uh, of the dimensions of food security with a couple others, one of them including agency. I'll just focus on agency for a section, for, for a second. Um, agency focuses on infrastructure and the self-efficacy. Um, so, this tool um, in general can be used for better planning. Um, it could be used as a planning tool. There's also a scale or a questionnaire that goes along with this. And all of this has been catered and based off of uh, the USDA tool um, that assesses food security, but it's been catered for a disaster context. It understands that there is gonna be some shifts in stability over time. It impl it's implied in that. And, this is not a static system. Things are going to change. Things are going to be one way, you know, a day after a disaster, and they're going to be another way 30 days after a disaster, and six months, they're going to be looking very differently as well. And so this is a framework which might help you plan a little bit better and understand all the components that go into food security after disasters. This framework has also been validated for a rural context. Um, and it's so it, it means it's a little bit more relevant to you all and your and your efforts. Next slide. Um, we took a little bit, this is a little bit of an original analysis. We took a, a look at our natural hazards index data that we produced at NCDP and overlaid it with low access SNAP households. So this is um, at more than 10 miles of the supermarket. And so if you look at the dark blue splotches um, and the dark purple and the dark, um, yeah, the dark purple really is what we wanna look at. Um, we can see pockets where there is an overlap of, of dependence on a federal assistance system and potential exposure to natural disasters. And again, this is trying to understand how context may affect that food system. Next slide. And this slide looks at the natural hazards index um, crossed with low access kids. So these are children that have uh, low access to supermarkets or are considered low access households. And an entirely different part of the map lights up, um, which tells us something else uh, differently as well, that um, parts of the Midwest, um, as well as the, the mountain areas um, uh, of the West require maybe a different kind of planning for, for children. Next slide. And so in our literature review, we had a few main takeaways and um, I'm not gonna read all of these, but we, we read um, something interesting that food deserts as a topic, as a, as a talking point can be misleading um, and that it's a red herring for food security and that access does not equal affordability. Just because there's a place to get food doesn't mean people can afford it. Um, and that um, emergency food assistance is incredibly important, um, especially right after disaster and um, but those needs might change over time and not be exactly the same. Um, and programs such as SNAP and WIC are incredibly important, as well as programs like DSNAP, which we are hoping to learn a little bit more about. Next slide. In a, in a separate little study that we're doing with Save the Children, we took a, a, a look and um, specifically around um, rural actors and food security, um, and did some qualitative research. And these are some very, very initial takeaways from people that we spoke with, but I think they might resonate and are important for everyone here to, to hear today. 
Um, so the first thing is that transportation and physical access for last mile food delivery is really unfeasible for some areas. And there is a large underestimation of outside actors to understand what is actually required for transportation um, and logistics in rural areas. Um, and this is something simple as, you know, um, it takes much, much longer to go a shorter distance um, compared to urban areas with more um, developed infrastructure. Um, there are major challenges around sufficient food storage and refrigeration at food banks or, or other storage facilities. And it really limits the amount of food that can be accepted of perishable food items, which can be accepted at any point in time. And several partners really um, um, brought up the importance of finding funding and resources to build and access larger refrigeration and storage units. Another is that local agriculture and livestock don't always benefit the local community. And in some areas they're shipped and processed elsewhere, often out of the country. Um, shelf stable food items are not always utilized by some recipients. Um, and this could be due to different cultural backgrounds, cooking or food preferences, um, or, or even storage uh, availability within their homes and cooking facilities. Um, we noted that there was a large and very wide array of food bank models and assistance programs, which included federally funded programs, um, farm to table products, school meals, backpack programs, um, and really varied everywhere we spoke with, everywhere to everyone we spoke with. And I think it just shows that there's a local context and that local context is critical for good disaster planning. Um, interestingly, many partner organizations had very little experience in disaster response and had little knowledge or experience with disaster food assistance programs. Um, and so there's an opportunity for education and awareness building there. But one thing is that everyone really noted um, that they are all logistics experts and um, um, pointed out that their expertise was often unrecognized and sometimes um, on purpose um, because they are very humble. Next slide. And so finally, some recommendations. Uh, um, we recommend um, engaging in some organizational level planning. And so um, there's something called continuity of operations planning, which is a business management um, tool um, that might help organizations plan a little bit better and understand those essential functions that must occur after disaster. Um, there's a link on the slide that takes you to a template and training that we offer um, in the RCRC toolbox um, that's editable and usable for all of you. Um, utilize the disaster food security framework as a planning tool and data collection tool. Um, consider and plan for how specific hazards may um, uh, impact food security after disaster. A, an extreme heat event may require different planning than a flood, which may require different planning than a tornado. Um, don't assume that all needs are, across, uh, are the same across any community and assume that all responses should be local and locally led. Lean on coalitions, build partnerships, strengthen relationships, and know who to call on for what. Um, I think reflecting on COVID-19 learnings and integrating them into your disaster planning is so important. Um, there's so much experience that we all gained during that time and turn it into some institutional memory and some structure within your organizations. And finally, recognize your own expertise. Um, so thank you uh, for your time. On the next slide, there's a link um, to the Save the Children Resource Center that has our QR code um, that will take you to some of the products that we have currently developed and will be developed in the future. Um, and for now, I will then uh, pass over to Nick, um, who's gonna take us into an organizational perspective of Convoy of Hope. Very good, very good. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for all that thick information. Um, definitely information that uh, communicates the industry well, best practices, and uh, super beneficial for multiple organizations to look at it um, in further times. Um, my name is Nick Wiersma. I've um, been with Convoy of Hope for nearly 15 years. Um, I've traveled the world responding to major disasters. If you think of all the big ones, I've been there, I've been on the ground, and then all the small ones that obviously hit uh, sometimes rural communities that are never in the news, they don't hit social media. Um, we try to hit those as well. Just for context, uh, Convoy of Hope started in 1994 in Northern California uh, by a gentleman by the name, by the name of Hal Donaldson, uh, simply by giving out some groceries from the back of a rented pickup truck. Um, and it's now a, a larger organization. We're based out of Springfield, Missouri. Uh, we have a 250,000 square foot warehouse and a fleet of tractor trailers. 
Um, though we're larger in size, we try to operate in a very uh, relational um, and very micro level as well at the same time with uh, our relationships and partners. So uh, kind of segueing and or I should say taking the baton and how Jonathan set the table really well of rolling into disasters in the rural context, uh, relationships are key. Um, I know we all say that, and I don't mean to sound cliche, um, but from an operational perspective from our side, though we're a larger organization, we have relationships that are held by the organization, not necessarily by each individual person. So we, we do a lot of information sharing and relationship sharing internally um, so that we can benefit from uh, the relationships, best practices, industry knowledge and such um, from the relationships that we have at large, not just by uh, individual team members. Um, you know, from when it comes to relationships, you know, the one thing about that is that time is a powerful tool. Um, so if you're new to this type of work, uh, just stay steady. If you're a veteran in this type of work within your organization, um, you know, the more relationships you build over time, it's, it's super critical from a federal level to a federal level, state level, county level, state, um, city level, um, you know, keep those relationships close and don't lose contact with them. When it comes to responding to disasters in, in rural communities, uh, truth be told, for some of those emergency managers or the fire department, police department, um, we're a faith-based organization for some of those churches. It may be the first and last disaster that they've ever responded to or have ever seen. Um, it's human nature uh, for city leadership to become uh, very tight in those moments when a disaster comes through, be it a flood, be it a tornado in rural America. Uh, traditionally, it's very common for them to want to clamp down and want to know and vet everything, everything that's taking place within their city, and they have the right to do that. Um, we find ourselves in a position where we actually spend a lot of time coaching city leadership. We spend a lot of time coaching uh, first responders, police and fire. We spend a lot of time coaching uh, city management and how the phases of a disaster play out. And a lot of those phases Jonathan shared previously, but even within the industry itself, a lot of the relationships that we wind up working with aren't familiar with them. Um, and so we spend a decent amount of time uh, working with city leadership just to coach them how the process will play out and, and let them know what we can do and what other organizations can do. Another thing we look at is current infrastructure and capacity um, within a city. We know full, full well that from an outside perspective, we can overwhelm a city with, with product. Uh, nowadays in the Western world, I will, I will say this, it's um, not that it's a game. Um, but product getting to a, a flood or a tornado, uh, it's amazing how fast and how quickly product actually shows up on the ground. Um, it might be in a church parking lot or a police department. And though that's great, um, and the need to get product there quickly is very important, uh, the need to get the right product there is more important. And so uh, in a timely manner. And so what we try to do with our partners that we work with is we try to throttle what we do um, we might be there fast, but we throttle with the volume of product that we bring and then share with the partner uh, that we're here for the long haul. We're not going anywhere. We're not going to come in, drop a bunch of product in your parking lot and then take off. Um, we want to be sensitive to them because the partners that we wind up working with have also been through the disaster. They've been through the tornado. They've been through the flood. So we need to be cognizant of that as well. Um, the next point. Find your lane. I want to encourage all of us as organizations. Um, we we can all have a tendency to want to meet every single need that we see. Um, when I would encourage us to find your strength as an organization, find your strength as a team, and stay true to that strength. If you build relationships with other other relationship or other organizations, that's great. Um, you know, you know have those other needs that you can't meet, connect with those other organizations, that's great. Uh, but don't try to become the answer to every single need that you see. Stay, stick with your strengths, learn best practices, industry standards within your own lane, um, and do the best you can to stay there. So um, moving on, to kind of touch base on getting there fast with distribution. I'll, I'll share this a little bit, even when it comes to uh, just uh, in Kentucky recently, there are tornadoes earlier this year. Um, and even in Maui, with the fires that took place, we were actually delivering product on horses and donkeys um, to get product to where it needed to be, um, up in the hills and such. And so once again, we had to throttle the pace of distribution, and it was not just a matter of coming in with full loads of product and then leaving it and then walking away from it and saying, oh, you know, hope it works out for you. So pacing out with the local relationships. Uh, cleanup may go fast, but recovery will take longer. Once again, be patient with the rural communities. Uh, people get tired, uh, they, they get, get exhausted. Um, 
and the recovery process will take a little bit longer. And as Jonathan shared, lean heavily into the local um, community organizations, active in disasters, the local co-ops. Um, and so uh, long-term recovery committees, we have, we have team members on staff that do long-term recovery. And so once again, even in that aspect, we find ourselves in a position where we're really coaching and training the local city leadership in, in how to handle long-term recovery. Last couple of points, be willing to go to the forgotten areas and communicate your organization's timelines and capacity. Uh, we know, we recognize that with every agency, um, that last bullet point to be willing to go to the forgotten areas, I know and we know that um, when the media is there, uh, that's kind of a big deal. A lot of organizations want to get there and get in front of the camera. Um, we tend to shy away from that. We tend to head towards the communities that are not getting the attention. Um, and we tend to head towards the families and the relationships that we have that will not be in the news. And so recognizing that their needs are just as important and their needs will probably last longer because they did not get the, the social media or the media attention. So, um, and then the last point here on this slide, communicate your organization's timelines and capacity. Uh, as you meet local partners and local agencies, city leadership, uh, be, be clear with them as far as what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, don't promise the world and only deliver a portion of it. You know, just be very accurate with what you can do. Next slide, please. Rural America 23, uh, kind of tagging on what Jonathan said a, little, a lot, the pandemic hurt rural America. Um, from our perspective and our side, during 2020, during COVID, our organization uh, distributed almost 3,000 tractor trailer loads of products around the country. Um, and though we're post COVID in 2023 alone, we'll probably be surpassing 500 loads of product that we distribute around the country because uh, needs are still high. And so we want to continue to lean into that um, and, and meet needs where we can. I, I will speak to that topic very quickly. Uh, from a broad perspective, the supply chain industry is quite complex. It's probably more complex than ever before post-COVID. And even ourselves as a large organization, um, it's taking more and more effort to get our hands on quality, nutritious food. Um, and I'm sure some of your agencies are experiencing the same type of situation as well. Uh, you're, it's not an isolated incident. It's across the entire supply chain industry as companies cut back, they cut back on food production, or they tighten the time frames of expiration dates. And so uh, you're not alone. And so everybody's kind of in this, uh, we're, in the, we're in the same fight together. Once again, moving on, uh, surround yourself with organizations that have expertise in other areas that you don't. Um, we're recognizing that, um, you know, once again, you can't do everything. Um, I'm going to be a little transparent here that my last two points of re being re uh, resilient and tired, um, that's not necessarily not necessarily to the partners in the rural communities. I'm speaking to the agencies or organizations that are trying to do work in rural communities. Um, we recognize everybody's in the same, same boat probably when it comes to some budget cutbacks of, or keeping things lean. Um, but I want to encourage, encourage us as organizations to uh, regroup. Uh, don't get discouraged, um, but once again, stick with your strengths, stick with your, um, you know, what's a sweet spot for you and stay close to your tight relationships and meet those needs where you can um, and ride the train. Don't feel the need to jump off track, uh, but recognizing that we're going to get through this on the backside. Next slide, please. Uh, real quick, kind of a couple more slides. We'll finish this out. The Bahamas warning. I was in the Bahamas for 45 days after Hurricane Dorian in 2019. Uh, just because there is an abundance of farmland does not mean they're nutritious food and it's, avail and it's available in its community. And uh, Jonathan's last slide, he made a point about just the fact that food is grown in a rural community doesn't mean that food is accessible to those individuals and families there. So post uh, Hurricane Dorian in, in the Bahamas, uh, we worked hard with local relationships to bring agriculture a little bit back to the Bahamas. It used to be a primarily self-sufficient nation. And that is no longer the case. They now import 80 to 90% of the product from the outside for the people to sustain themselves. And the unfortunate reality is that rural America is the same, it's the same boat. And so we're working hard behind the scenes to look at the topic of agriculture. Um, even within rural America, though they're surrounded by some of the richest black dirt in the world, um, it doesn't mean that nutritious food is available for, for them. And so agriculture is a key that we're trying to look into for our next phase. Last slide. Kind of a 2023 narrative, and then I'll pass it to Pam here. Um, as we have seen the needs accelerate in rural America, we're quickly realizing that every agency needs to maximize their available time and resources. The needs and opportunities are outpacing our capacities. 
make changes where necessary, and even recalibrate your expectations for a season if needed. So once again, kind of speaking to us as a, as a group of organizations in, in this conference, um, kind of do a quick reevaluation of yourself, stick with your strengths, find out what the needs are, can you meet those needs, and live in a state of learning. Um, but I do encourage us as organizations to stay in the game, <clears throat> encouraged, uh, learn from one another, and then put positive pressure on things over time. Uh, if you feel like you need to re rebuild yourself, go ahead and rebuild yourself. You need to rebrand yourself, rebrand yourself. Um, just because you've done it that way for a long time doesn't mean you need to keep doing it that way. Uh, because, because we're all sharing that COVID has changed so many things so much. Well, then we need to adapt to those changes in rural, rural America as well. And so once again, at the end of the day, the goal is to meet the needs of the people. And if we need to shift and adjust along the way, then, then we need to do that. So that pretty much brings me to the end of my, uh, my short presentation. And then uh, from this point forward, I'm going to pass it on up to you, Pam. You guys have done an awesome job. I guess I could just go home. Uh, you all have done a wonderful job, Jonathan and Nick. Hi, I'm Dr. Pam Chapman. They call me the boss lady. Um, we are the organization Boss Lady Economic Planning Development. Um, and I want to just talk with you uh, for a short period about how we provided a service um, joined um, the disaster that happened in Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Um, and that was in March of 2024. Um, we've learned that uh, working um, in rural areas during disaster, it takes a lot of planning. Um, we learned that through training, but we also learned it hands on being involved. Um, during the March 24th uh, storm damage in Rolling Fork in the Mississippi Delta, um, when you talk about rural, uh, Rolling Fork is about as rural as it can get. Um, so we learned that it's important to um, connect the dots. It's important to um, have everybody at the seat at the table. Uh, we're talking about state officials. We're talking about local officials. We're talking about regional officials. We're talking about global because it takes everyone to be hands on um, in serving in rural um, during a disaster. Um, here you can see where we partner with a, a national organization and they brought down here on um, this picture here, uh, pallets and truckloads of chicken. And we had to use transportation um, to be able to reach um, these hundreds of family um, in rural areas. Um, change slide, please. And we found out that it's important to also not just have um, local and state and regional partnerships. We also found that it's important to have relationships and partnerships with even celebrities um, because the key is getting the resources to rural Mississippi. You know, how do you get that? So it takes everybody um, to be hands on deck in providing a service, getting the resources to the many of hundreds of children, uh, to the elderly community. Rural Mississippi, there are places that do not have uh, stores um, that is maybe 35 miles away. So we learned this during um, the Rolling Fork disaster um, here in the Mississippi Delta. Here you see that Master P, um, who's well known, a business uh, guru, who's a who's a rapper, who came down just to try to help us um, with all the children to keep the children calm. We had a lot of children that were affected during the storm that um, start to suffer from anxiety and depression and fear. Uh, and so he came down and he brought cereal um, from every Walmart store. He bought them out and, and he gave them back to rural Mississippi Delta, the, those particular communities that had been suffering uh, due to storms. Change slide, please. We also want to talk about how we were able to partner with Save the Children. Save the Children was so vital uh, in assisting us during the storm. Um, this storm, we went way into uh, Sharkey County as well, which is a great distance 
um, that did not have a lot of food resources uh, at hand. And so we were able to partner with state organizations, regional organizations, and get several 18 wheelers of food um, to this disaster area. Not only did we provide them with food necessity, we provide them with clothing and, and blankets and all because they lost totally everything. So we wanted to be there to make sure that we had the connection uh, to the different agencies who had the resources. It is important that when you're dealing with disasters in rural, whatever state it is, but specifically Mississippi, you have to have every agency, whether it's local, uh, regional, national, and global. You have to have all of these agencies at the table. You have to have conversations before the storms happen. It is important that we train, go to as many trainings, uh, connect to as many uh, disaster organizations that are out there to make sure that we get the food on the ground. There were children here on this slide here that hadn't really got anything to eat in two or three days. That's not good. So we want to be an organization that when a storm happens, we want to be on the ground, but we also want to be on the ground with reliable, reliable and the right resources to make sure that these children and these families are well taken care of. Now, we partnered with the Walton Foundation and we created the first ever Storm Victim Transportation Initiative. With the Storm Victim Transportation Initiative, in this rural area, it was 100. Everybody was excited because we were able to take these individuals that were affected by the storm, take them to get clothing, take them to get food, take them to those who wanted to uh, jobs, take them to the jobs, take them if they had a medical emergency. We took them, them there. If we also work with the schools because some of the schools suffered damages to their buses and their vehicles. So we became the canuity to helping not just the citizens that were affected by the storm, we were able to also lend a helping hand to the city and the county officials when trying to get where they need to get from A to B during a storm. Next slide, please. And here you see Mid-South Foundation out of Memphis, Tennessee. In the middle, we have the mayor of Clarksdale, Mississippi. That's right. We try to train and create relationships and partnerships, not just with emergency people, but we also try to train state and local officials the importance of getting their hands and to help serve their own community. It is so vital to have relationships with food organizations like Mid-South Food Bank out of Memphis, Tennessee. That agency came down with fresh, good, wholesome food that we were able to distribute to hundreds of people by having relationships, by having volunteers that could help us pack boxes, unload boxes, but not just that. We had the relationship and the partnership with transportation. And I'm gonna continue to say that over and over. Every organization globally that deals with disasters and storms need to have a relationship, a partnership, or a budget set aside. So when a storm happens, you now have transportation. How do you get those people out of there when a storm happens? You need a partnership. You need a relationship with transportation in your area. And that's what we have done. We have created a relationship, a partnership with about 10 different transportation agencies in rural Mississippi Delta. So that when something happens, no part of whatever part you're at or live, a storm hits there, we can execute, and that's a key word. We've got to learn how do we execute 
the transportation to help these families in rural Mississippi Delta. Next slide, please. I want to talk about how do we connect? Connecting is so important, meaning that number one, we have to plan. During this last storm that hit the Mississippi Delta, we were able to provide transportation in rural areas such as Humphreys County, Sharkey mm -hmm. County, and Monroe County. These areas are nowhere near close to each other. They are truly what you call rural Mississippi Delta area. And we were able to provide the necessity of food, fresh, healthy food, fresh vegetables and fruits to these families, to hundreds of families, because we had a transportation initiative in place to provide those particular services, to help those particular families. And I want to say that without relationships, such as Community Foundation of Northwest Mississippi, such as Save the Children, such as Walton Foundation, such as um, CARES, which is a global disaster organization. If we did not have these particular organization in place, where would Mississippi, rural Mississippi Delta residents who are affected and affected by the disaster, what, where would we be? we would be left out. And let's not talk about how long does it take for us to get funding. The, the past few disasters that we had in March and April, it took us so long to really get the resources that we need. We're still waiting right now on trailers uh, for people to live in. And that remember, that was March 24th. It is October. And we're still um, trying to help people transport them from, from hotels. Uh, we're still uh, transporting and bringing in fresh produce. We're still uh, working and bringing in transporting uh, clothing items because the funds are extremely slow when it comes down to rural areas. And let's be transparent. We're talking about poverty. We're talking about poverty rural communities that when a disaster happens, they're already struggling for food because there's no grocery stores in the area. They're already struggling because there's no transportation, public transit there. So in a disaster, we as disaster preparers need to already have in position a plan of action. How do we get fresh food to the children? How do we get fresh food and produce to the families that live and reside in rural Mississippi Delta uh, during a disaster? It is so important to be a relationship. It's so important to have relationship like the Convo of Hope. They have been tremendous helpful to the Mississippi Delta. We call them, we tell them that we, we've been in a disaster. We call them and tell them that we're short on food. They have answered the call. So it's about building relationships and partnership with those organizations that, number one, they're going to answer the call. Save the children. They're going to answer the call. They were on the ground during the March 24th uh, storm damage. They were here helping bring in fresh food, fresh, uh, fresh uh, produce, meat. They brought in everything to make sure that these families had food during this disaster. So it is important. And so again, as I say again, one of the challenges for rural Mississippi or rural areas is the lack of slow funding and resources coming in. And the only way you can beat that and get on top of that, it's going to take a lot of planning, planning and relationships and partnerships, but most importantly, connecting the dots. And I'm so grateful that we've had the opportunity to, to build a relationship, a sustainable relationship with Save the Children, who has answered the call for rural Mississippi. Every time we've had a disaster, they have answered the call. They are there to make sure that we have fresh food 
and fresh vegetables and fresh, I mean, everything that we need when it comes to fighting child hunger and fighting hunger in a disaster, Save the Children has been there. And I'd like to thank each of you, Jonathan and Nick, you have done an awesome job in laying out what everyone needs to do to help in rural areas in a disaster. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Pam. <clears throat> uh, amazing. And um, thank you to you and Nick and uh, Pam, just a, an amazing story of really creating some systemic change and building a systems response and a system in to have a system in place to address these transportation issues and 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 a holistic approach to it. So it's very impressive. Um, so hats off to you. Um, I, thank I, you. I think my first question to you, Pam, um, one of the challenges I think that we have um, in community engagement and and um, this kind of relationship and coalition building and relationship building is just the fact that everyone has got so much on their plate. Everyone Absolutely. is stressed out. Everyone has all kinds of worries, if you will, and priorities that may shift over time. Um, and it's hard to create some of these sustainable partnerships and relationships. Um, how how do you create those sustainable partnerships and relationships? And how do you get people to the table? What is that value proposition that that gets people interested, excited, engaged, and remaining so over time? I think my strength has been executing, but also building a pipeline. I have a pipeline all the way to Washington, D.C. And so when I call the Congressman, Congressman Benny Thompson, who represents Mississippi, he knows that he has to execute because I put pressure, uh, pressure that our children, our elderly and our families, they need help. And so it's important to not just wait till a disaster happens, but let's pre-plan. Let's put some strategic things in place. Let's talk about the last storm that happened and, and where did the ball get dropped? How can we improve from that particular point? And so for me, it's about not just having meetings just to be having meetings, but let's put a plan of action together that we can execute, that when a disaster happens, everyone know their place. Everyone knows their strength and everybody knows what to do. And that's how you get them to the table, making sure that everybody stays in their own lane and executing. And that echoes one of Nick's takeaways as well, staying in your lane and understanding what you're good at and um, what you might not be good at, but you need help with. Mm -hmm. um, Nick, you, you, you mentioned um, a little bit earlier about in your presentation in the beginning about how um, some of your relationships are institutional. They're not just individually based. Mm. Um, I'm just curious from a practical perspective and an operational perspective, how do you manage that knowledge and information at an institutional level when we know that relationships, you know, relationships mean like having coffee with somebody or having a charismatic personality and mm. being able to connect with people. Um, but those those relationships, your point, are incredibly important and and perhaps um, building them into the institution rather than just an individual creates sustainability. So how, literally, how, how do you all do that? Uh, yeah, actually, internally, uh, we actually put forth a lot of effort um, to maintain relationships. The, the raw joke behind the scenes is that if one of us gets hit by a bus, we don't want to lose all those relationships. And so our organization has been around for 29 years. And so over those 29 years, you know, there's, there's strength in time and an accumulation and that success within an operation of meeting the needs of people is not based moment by moment. It's, it's cumulative over time. And so as a team, we, we actually, you know, simply have Google maps that we create within ourselves. Um, and we share all of the relationships that we respond to a disaster. Uh, we share all the city relationships, police, fire, um, city emergency management, um, the co-ads, uh, you know, the long-term recovery groups. And so we will share them as a team to basically our, our own internal platform. Um, and reason being is that, you know, a lot of organizations have higher turnover. And, you know, if we respond to a disaster in the state of Kentucky again, or whatever the case may be, or the Delta, 
um, as our sister's referring to, we don't want to walk in as an organization and start over all, you know, start all over again every single time we respond to a disaster. If there's a close proximity of a relationship, we want to start where we left off. And so, uh, so it, once again, it's just out of relationship sharing internally. When it comes to role and function within ourselves, uh, truth be told, we actually follow an ICS model within ourselves, an incident command structure. So our team is structured just like the fire department is in how we approach things. And so though we might have a person on staff with that role to manage those relationships, at the end of every disaster, we share all the relationships as a team uh, so that moving forward, we, we move forward together as a pack, not as individuals. That's, that's very interesting that you are utilizing incident command system um, to manage. Um, and for those of you watching who aren't familiar, um, it's, it's exactly what Nick said. It's um, a system of command and control um, that was actually developed in California in the Cal OES and the fire system there. Um, but it's a very flexible, scalable, adaptable chain of command structure that includes planning and logistics and several other functions um, that can be readily adapted and deployed um, in an emergency and anybody can take over those job roles and responsibilities at any time. So that's, that's really interesting that you all are using that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly makes sense. <laughs> um, this is a question for both of you. We can start with Pam and then go to Nick. Um, uh, if there's one thing that you would ask your partners and collaborators to have um, that would contribute to effective disaster response and recovery, what would that be? Um, could be anything. What would that one thing be to improve um, the best response? Um, planning. Planning. Um, so often when disasters happen, um, you know, everybody starts to immediately then say, let's call a meeting. Let's call a meeting and, and, and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. Well, that should already be in place. So if you plan, um, you are able to handle situation without being under distress. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it helps a lot of organization. You know, I come from a television background for 25 years. Uh, and as a assignment manager and a news director, that's all we did was plan, 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 plan. And so if you plan, you plan to prepare of how do you handle uh, a situation in a crisis? And so I think every organization needs to have a plan of action already in position, mm -hmm. in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. If I can, uh, if I can take the baton and take it a little bit more granular, um, when we respond to a disaster and our situation, sometimes we'll show up in a, a church parking lot or a fire department parking lot. Um, but say we're in a church parking lot and we'll say, hey, does anybody have a relationship with city leadership? Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a rough day when everybody looks at each other and says we don't we don't know anybody. It's a beautiful Absolutely. day. And it's a beautiful day when someone whips out their cell phone and says, "Hey Jim, it's me." And Jim just happens to be the police chief, the fire chief, or the mayor. Uh, that's a big win for us. Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think another big win uh, for our partners to consider is having a good assessment of their own community. Um, where are their apartment complexes that may have lost power? Um, where are the flood prone zones, you know, post hurricane, uh, traditionally post hurricane, all the flooding takes place in a low lying land and the low lying land is usually the, the least expensive real estate. And it's usually the economic community that can least afford to be impacted by a flood. And yes. so just knowing where the, the flood prone neighborhoods are is a big deal for us, uh, where the crime ridden neighborhoods are, are a big deal for us. Um, mm -hmm. So just having putting positive pressure on the local relationships so they have a good self-evaluation of the city that they live in because um, it saves a lot of time on the front side. We can respond smarter and faster and more effectively by gleaning from the, uh, the data from the, local, from the locals because um, we don't have that local data. The locals do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that we do, Nick and Jonathan, is that we have every mayor um, every uh, city board of alderman number uh, in our Rolodex, we have all of our state officials uh, in our Rolodex, and we have our national people uh, just one call away. Um, when something happens, we know, let's give them a call. Um, and we keep all those numbers in our Rolodex. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your experiences and your insights and um, really 
um, I think grounding us in in what it's like in in real response and and recovery settings, um, which we kind of not all of us are always exposed to, and and having that context is really important. And um, I think for everybody watching, um, you know, maybe that disaster hasn't hit in your community. Um, and I hate to say it, it's not it's not if, but it's when. Um, there's going to be something that's going to affect your community and um, in ways that you haven't thought about. Um, and I think some of the advice that you've heard today and some of the resources that you have access to and through Save the Children and No Kid Hungry um, can help better prepare. Um, I see a tendency sometimes for organizations and communities to rely on improvisation. Um, and while people are incredibly resourceful and incredibly creative um, and, and really rise to the occasion, um, there's something to be said about good planning and good planning um, creates a relaxed state of mind. It creates order and not chaos. Yeah. Um, and it creates uh, stability um, within uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so um, with that, thank you all for, for joining us today. And um, feel free to reach out to any of us with any questions if you have anything um, that you want to follow up on. Thank you.